Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 19th meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. We've got one uh, apologies today. Uh, Kenneth Gibson, MSP, can't be with us this morning. We intend to move uh, to agenda item two. Uh, and we'll return to Agenda Item 1 uh, shortly after. So Agenda Item 2, Subordinate Legislation. The Committee will consider the following 2017 Negative Instrument 187, 188 and 1893 instruments as listed on the agenda. These instruments are laid under the negative procedure, which means that their provisions will come into force unless the Parliament votes on a motion to annul these instruments. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered 187 and 189 at its meeting on the 13th of June 2017 and determined that it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument on any grounds within its remit. As set out in the paper, the DPLR Committee considered 188 at its meeting yesterday, following correspondence between the Committee and the Scottish Government in relation to drafting errors in the instrument. The Scottish Government intends to bring forward an amending instrument which DPLR and this Committee will consider. So, that said, no motions to annul have been laid. Can I invite members to make any comments on any of the instruments before us this morning? Uh, Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Convener. Yes, I do want to make a, a comment on the Building Miscellaneous Amendments Scotland Regulations 2017. Uh, it includes provisions to um, enable the uh, building of recreational huts uh, in the countryside, which has been a campaign that's been running for a few years, so it's a very welcome to see the uh, statutory framework around that finally uh, completing its its journey. Thank you, Mr Whiteman, for putting that on the record. Can I ask if any other members have any comments to make in any of the statutory instruments before us this morning? Okay. There have been no other comments. Can I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to any of these instruments? Are we agreed? Okay. okay. Thank you. Will that... Uh, ends agenda item two and we'll suspend briefly. Okay, can I welcome everyone back uh, to the 19th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2017. And we now move to agenda item one, which is post-legislative scrutiny on the Disabled Persons Parking Places Scotland Act 
2009. Can I first of all welcome uh, Jackie Bailey, MSP, who's with us this morning, who was the member in charge of this this bill when it made its course through through Parliament successfully. Thank you for joining us this morning, Jackie. Uh, and can, of course, uh, uh, now move to take evidence from the Minister for Transport and Islands on its post-legislative scrutiny of the Act. And can I also, therefore, welcome... Uh, Hamza Yusuf, Minister for Transport and the Islands, who is accompanied by George Henry, Head of Road Policy, and Sharon Wood, Senior Road Policy Officer, Transport Scotland. Thank you all. You're, you're wel welcome here this morning. And can I invite the Minister to make an opening statement? Uh, good morning, and thank you, Convener. Apologies for any mix-up uh, with the timing, but delighted to be here. Uh, over the years, parking has become an emotive subject, be it on street, uh, be it private, be it footway parking or indeed uh, disabled parking. There have been calls to either review or indeed to legislate on this matter. But it's important to remember that parking can and does, of course, play a positive uh, aspect in many people's lives. The provision of disabled parking bays has helped to improve access for disabled people to carry out day-to-day -day activities that non-disabled people uh, often, I have to say, take for granted. Misusing such bays is not just impacting on access, it impacts, of course, on disabled people's ability to play an active role and a full role in our society. As uh, Jackie Bailey, MSP, has explained during the evidence sessions, the Disabled Persons Parking Places Scotland Act 2009 seeks to make all advisory disabled parking bays enforceable, as well as requiring local authorities pr pr to promote the proper use of such bays. I believe that the 2009 Act has certainly improved the situation by ensuring that all on-street disabled parking bays are enforceable, along with those that are found in, in local authority uh, off-street car parks. However, I fully acknowledge uh, that uh, the bill has not fully achieved its aims in relation to enforcement <coughs> of disabled bays in privately owned car parks, such as those, for example, controlled by supermarket chains. Indeed, the evidence that has been provided by local authorities in respect to the committee's post-legislative post scrutiny uh, and to my officials via the annual reports calls for changes in a number of areas, including, for example, Section 8 of the Act, removing the need for local authorities to contact landowners' businesses to request agreement to enforce disabled parking bays on landowners' behalf. Uh, for example, also removing the need for developing, consulting and publishing TROs to make disabled parking bays enforceable to reduce the cost impact on councils. And another issue, uh, making the reporting requirements for local authorities uh, less onerous. Since receiving powers under the Scotland Act 2016 to legislate on parking, we have been working with representatives from the parking industry, uh, working with local authorities, disability organisations, the business community and indeed the motoring industry in the development and publication of our consultation paper. Uh, this is the first time that the Scottish Government has been able to undertake such a detailed review of parking in Scotland. As such, we're using this opportunity to review a range of parking issues, not just the issue of footway parking, which of course is hugely important, but how parking is managed and enforced across the country, including disabled parking. As the committee is aware, since the introduction of the 2009 Act, there has been considerable change in the parking landscape. We now have 18 local authorities in Scotland with uh, decriminalised parking enforcement, DPE powers. In addition, there's been legislation to expand the eligibility criteria for a blue badge, as well as powers to tackle misuse of the blue badge scheme. However, I acknowledge that we still have a long way to go to ensure that all disabled parking, be it on street or indeed off street, is managed and enforced in a consistent manner. Uh, that is why I'm committed to working with local authorities uh, on this issue, as well as, of course, the UK government uh, and, indeed, if necessary, other devolved administrations. My officials will be setting up a stakeholder working group consisting of parking managers from all local authorities in Scotland to explore how we can resolve the issues that have been raised as part of the committee's evidence sessions. The findings from both our own consultation paper, which uh, closes at the end of this month, and indeed the committee's post-legislative scrutiny, uh, will help to inform our next steps. As always, of course, uh, Convener, I am now happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Minister, for, for, that, for those opening remarks and much of the content within your opening remarks I think we'll return to in a structured fashion to tease out some of the evidence behind that as we go uh, through the meeting. Um, but our opening question from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Morning, Minister. 
you touched very much there on your opening remarks about the objectives uh, of the, the Act and how that has been uh, perceived and how, it, how well it's being achieved. Uh, so carrying on from that, uh, do you believe that the Act has achieved most of uh, it, its objectives, uh, or are there some objectives that you still think require to be uh, looked at, or are there other things that may well come from uh, the Act itself? Mm. Uh, thank the member for, for the question. Uh, I took great interest in reading the uh, transcripts of, of the evidence sessions. I wasn't able uh, to, to watch them live, I'm afraid, other commitments, but uh, having read through the transcripts, uh, and I would associate myself with um, the remarks of uh, Max Mobility Access and Committee, who, whose view was that the legislation had partially, I think that was the word they used, partially met its aims. I would agree with that. Um, as I said in my, my opening remarks, that there's no doubt that um, there have been great successes in terms of uh, on-street parking and local authority off-street parking. Um, for example, in 2015-16, uh, 13 local authorities, we could get data from 13 local authorities issued uh, eight and a half, uh, sorry, 8,000 uh, penalty charge notices um, to motorists that were misusing uh, disabled parking base. So there is evidence there. However, you know, it would be foolish not to recognise the criticisms, very fair criticisms from uh, particularly disability organisations about the, <clears throat> a couple of things, the inconsistency that they thought uh, applied between on-street and, and off-street uh, parking in particular. I think that was a common thread almost from uh, almost every single disability organisation that came in front uh, of your committee. So, um, you know, I don't take that lightly. I think the, the, the Act certainly has met some of its aims, but clearly uh, we need to go further than others, and that's why this post-legislative scrutiny is important, alongside our consultation uh, and alongside some of the stakeholder management groups that we have. And, and, and following on from that, the, the idea that we've heard from many people about the potential of maybe trying to have a public awareness campaign to, to promote once again, and identify uh, some of the areas that, that need to, the public need to be aware of uh, that the Act has uh, and the, the problems that this can cause for individuals. Uh, so I'd like to tease out from yourself, is there any possibility that the Scottish Government might be prepared to take that forward? Uh, because that has certainly been called for uh, by a number of stakeholders and a number of organisations uh, to try and create this public awareness. The answer is yes, that we'd be interested in speaking to local authorities, uh, to the police for a, a hard-hitting you know, campaign on this. And I think uh, your idea, uh, your suggestion that you alluded to is a very good one, in that I don't think people understand quite the impact it has on a disabled uh, person uh, when they can't get uh, to an access to a disabled uh, parking bay uh, because somebody is misusing that. Uh, they might think they're just nipping into the shop for 10 minutes and that's the closest. Or, you know, they may think, oh, I've got children and, and you know, it's, it's fine for me to use it. Nobody else is using it just now. Uh, but actually, the, the impact that could have in somebody's life is something that uh, I think unless you have a disability, then you could, uh, then you realise. So I'd be more than happy to have those discussions. In fact, we will have those discussions with local authorities and police. I, I wouldn't commit to necessarily uh, saying they will certainly have uh, a public awareness campaign, but, I, but I, I think it would be right for us to explore what we should do in, on, in that respect. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Okay, thank you. Specifically on a public awareness campaign, Mr. Simpson? Yes. Graham Simpson. Just a supplementary. Thanks, convener. Um, there was a, a survey done by uh, Churchill um, Insurance. Um, they found that uh, nearly 12 million drivers I th across the UK have admitted in one year to parking where they shouldn't, which is a, a, a staggering figure. Um, so going on the, um, the idea of having a public awareness campaign, um, I wonder, you know, I think we, we, we need to get across the idea that for disabled people, their disability lasts a lifetime. But somebody, somebody can just park in, a, in their space for a few minutes, and it's only a few minutes to that person, but for that disabled person, it's a lifetime of disability. So I think that's a, a sort of clear message that we need to get across, and we almost need to uh, embarrass people into not parking in disabled spaces. And it was just to make that point, convener. Point, Mr. Simpson, it has to be cultural and acceptable across the board to 
to use and abuse disabled bees without permission? Do you want to add any, anything further? No, uh, it would be interesting, uh, the, the Churchill survey, I haven't seen it, so um, I don't know if maybe uh, my officials could ask you for some of the detail on that. But yeah, uh, sure. It's a quite a shocking statistic, actually, so yes. nothing more to add than yes. other than I agree with what the member says. OK, thank you. Uh, Jenny Goldruth. And good morning to the panel. Good morning, Minister. Um, with regard to uh, Alexander Stewart's initial question, uh, Minister, in your response, you spoke about um, inconsistencies in terms of how the legislation was being applied um, and the fact that it partially achieved its objectives. So uh, in terms of where we are nationally, I wonder, does Transport Scotland currently gather or hold any statistics on the numbers of uh, enforceable bays or on the numbers of advisory disabled bays? I actually asked this question of, of Transport Scotland um, we were in a pre-meeting uh, yesterday, uh, sorry, this week, and um, uh, we don't have those statistics and that it's not a requirement as part of the legislation for local authorities to tell us how many uh, bays they have, whether they're enforceable or indeed advisory, uh, and you can imagine that probably changes week by week. Unfortunately, some people might pass away who had a disabled bay in the street. Uh, of course, there'll be you know new developments and so on and so forth. Um, but that's not to say that, that you couldn't have a rolling or evolving document or spreadsheet, for example, that would, would, would provide those statistics. So what we can do, uh, because we don't have those statistics, and we're more than happy to ask officials to go to local authorities and ask them for that information. Um, it's not to say that every local authority will necessarily have uh, all of that, particularly the advisory um, MBAs, but I'm more than happy to ask the question and then report back to, to committee because we don't hold that information, okay. and neither, neither is there necessarily a requirement to, to have that information. Thank you. And just as a kind of follow up to that, has Transport Scotland, are you aware, taken any action recently uh, to improve the availability and enforcement of disabled parking places? And perhaps if Transport Scotland hasn't, could that link to Alexander Stewart's second question, which was with regard to a public awareness uh, campaign? Um, I, mean, I think the biggest change in this landscape uh, for me over the last few years has been uh, DPE, to refer to that decriminalising uh, parking enforcement. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, I think that's been that's been you know, a huge take up of that amongst local authorities. Uh, Eighteen uh, that that have it, uh, three uh, in the process. And I think the others will, uh, you know, for, for for the ones that certainly uh, uh, feel that they can afford to do so. Um, others will come on board, and I can come back to that point perhaps in, in, in later questioning. But um, you know, DPE has been been the biggest in encouraging local authorities to go down that route uh, where they can. Uh, is something that Transport Scotland, of course, has been doing, and, and, and I, as minister, encourage local authorities. Uh, we are also looking uh, at what comes out from this committee's evidence ses sessions, because it will, as well as the improving parking consultation. Um, uh, form what we do next. So there is more that we can do. We recognise that. Um, that's why the consultation, which is a very wide-ranging consultation, I should say, it's not just about enforcement of disabled parking, also footway parking and uh, some other issues are, are in that consultation, which members may be aware of. That ends on, on the 30th of June, though. There's an extension for local authorities, I think, because of the local authority elections uh, until the end of August. So um, DP, uh, alongside any measures that come out of the consultation, alongside the evidence session that comes out of this, actually the timing of all of this is, is pretty good, but will help to inform what our, our next steps are on that. And, uh, I think I've, I've already made mention on the uh, public awareness campaign, I think Jenny Goldruth's suggestion is, is, is obviously an eminently sensible one that you know we wait to see you know, the evidence that comes forward from both consultations and committees and then perhaps tailor a campaign uh, around, around what are the most pertinent issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Elaine Smith. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, in terms of the on street disabled per parking places and with regard to local authorities, are you satisfied that local authorities have taken sufficient action to convert advisory bays into enforceable bays? Again, the short answer to that would be yes. I mean, the 18 local authorities that have uh, uh, that have DPE three that are going through the application process, um, you know, uh, they they uh, I think are absolutely moving forward. I understand that not every local authority feels that they can uh, financially make the case of, of going through the DPE process, and I think there's a bit of work for us to do in government um, with those local authorities um, and, and talk to them about even uh, perhaps sharing uh, services with a, a local authorities that are neighbouring that have a DP and I can again come back to this uh, perhaps uh, later in questioning. So I, I do, I think local authorities are, are doing a good job and the on-street, as, as the member talks about, the on-street parking, I think local authorities are doing 
um, a good job. And generally, the evidence sessions I, I thought reflected that. I think there were still some criticisms of, 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 of local authorities to an extent from from some organisations. But my view would be that um, generally, local authorities are uh, taking uh, sufficient action as, as, as she asks. Okay, thanks. Um, if I may continue, convener. Yes, of course. Yes. Thank you. In your written submission, um, Minister, you say on the second page that we have that it, it's become, and I'm reading from your submission, it's become clear from the responses and information provided by local authorities that their statutory obligations in providing enforceable disabled persons parking places are placing considerable demands on their resources. I wonder if you could maybe expand a bit further on that and tell the committee whether uh, indeed the Scottish Government has provided any financial or practical support around the tasks of identifying and converting the advisory bays into enforceable bays? Yeah, I think it's a really good, good question. Um, go back to, to obviously the legislation when it was passed in 2009 and obviously every piece of legislation comes with a financial memorandum and as these things tend to go, I know that uh, as, as Gillian Martin, for example, is taking forward the seatbelts uh, bill, uh, on school transport, that uh, you know, this is done in conjunction with local authorities, where local authorities are effect affected. So, you know, conversation will take place with COSLA. Uh, there will be a negotiation, a discussion about what they think uh, will be the cost impact of that. And generally speaking, local authorities, uh, when when the act went through, uh, you know, this was the, the the cost implications were going to be met from uh, existing budgets. Now, that's not to say uh, that for some local authorities, um, they feel that going down the DPE route for them would be financially, uh, sim simply wouldn't stack up. Uh, and I think that's where we have to do a little bit of work. So um, I, I think there's some, perhaps uh, we should be exploring with local authorities. We have done this to an extent, but exploring with local authorities that whether they could partner or indeed uh, have some sort of even service level agreement with neighboring local authorities that may have DPE how can they share so they can they can, some of the cost could come uh some of the cost could be shared um and that would lessen the financial burden that some local authorities feel uh that dpe could place uh, upon them um if they had to set up everything uh themselves so i'm happy to kind of explore uh certainly that um though this approach is something that my officials will be taking forward in a little bit more detail with stakeholders including cosla uh, and indeed scots uh, as well um as part of the the, the stakeholder group that I, that I spoke about in my opening uh, remarks um but uh, of course uh, you know it's worth stressing that any local authority that takes forward dp the whole point is it's meant to be self-financing um that, that is that is um one of the uh uh, that is one of the criteria as far as they can possibly make that self uh, that uh, that that proposal uh, stack up. So I suppose to take that just a little bit further, then, uh, from the original proposals in the legislation, is it the case then that the, the the cuts over that session to local authorities have had an impact? You talked about the stakeholder group, and I suppose that then also takes me back to the author of the bill, who's sitting round the table with us, and I wonder <laughs> whether or not. Um, I know she's too shy and retiring, perhaps, to put this to yourself, but I wonder if she has been asked if she wanted to be included in the stakeholder group and whether that might help to inform that process as well. For the record, um, it's Jackie, Jackie Bailey, Bailey, MSP, that, we're, <laughs> that, that our deputy convener is referring to. Apologies. Yeah, and for the record, everybody had a wry smile on the face when she was described as shy and retiring, but, that was, uh, but I, uh, I simply wouldn't comment on, on why that was the case. Um, I... Uh, a couple of things I would say. Um, I don't want to get in a to and fro uh, with any members about uh, local authorities, budget settlements, and you know I would make the, the point uh, that uh, they have more spending power than they've had uh, previously, and so on and so forth. But you know we'd end up getting in a, a bit of a to and fro. I, I don't want to take that away from the fact that I absolutely understand that for some local authorities, going down the DP route for them would financially simply not stack up and be too difficult. Uh, for them, so therefore, I think there's a responsibility on this government to try to work with local authorities um, uh, and try to find some sort of solution to that. As I say, whether it's a, almost a, a hybrid DP or sharing services or a service level agreement with local authorities, 
uh, that are neighbouring. Uh, in terms of the, the parking managers group, it really is for parking managers of local authorities uh, to come around the table and be part of that uh, group to inform what we're doing um, as opposed to, to, to MSPs or indeed any other elected members, councillors or, or otherwise. Um, but, you know, if an approach came from any member, uh, of course, I would look at that. But um, as I say, the moment, the stakeholders group is particularly for parking managers, of course, uh, Jackie Bailey, Elaine Smith, any other member uh, of this chamber could, of course, input, uh, could write to me, could write to my officials, could input on a regular basis. Uh, and I would, I'm genuinely very open minded uh, on this issue because really we have a shared aim. Our shared aim is to ensure that people are not misusing disabled parking bays uh, and indeed that uh, our services, uh, right at a local level, is, are, are as accessible as possible to everybody, regardless of disabled or able bodiedness. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Archbishop Minister. I'm sure those comments will help build uh, Ms Bailey's confidence in making an approach to, your, to yourself, Minister. Uh, we'll move to uh, Mr Whiteman now. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, thank you, Minister, for coming to see us today. Um, we've heard concerns from disabled organisations about uh, inconsistency in the level of enforcement uh, between different local authorities across Scotland. And I wonder if you have any views on that, in particular, um, their concerns relating to um, what they regard as minimal levels of enforcement where Police Scotland remain responsible for parking enforcement. Yeah, and that, that latter point about um, you know Police Scotland's ability to enforce uh, uh, misuse of, of, of parking bays, uh, you know, we'd ha only have to look at the incidents that we've seen across the United Kingdom in the last couple of months to realise how stretched the police across the United Kingdom are. There's a number of threats, a number of priorities that they face. Um, and uh, you know, misusing a parking bay, and uh, you know, understandably for police when there's an emergency or a crisis, that might you know that would of course be top of, of, of their priority. That's not to take away from the impact it would absolutely have on somebody um, with a disability. So that's why we encourage local authorities to go through the DP process to decriminalise the parking uh, enforcement in their local authority area because I think from the evidence session again, when I read the transcripts, the police officer who was here it said that. You know, they would love, love councils to take on the, the responsibility um, of, of enforcing uh, parking uh, because, again, it frees them up to, to, do, to, to, to do other things. However, where that isn't the case in the local authorities that have not gone through the DP process, uh, you know, it's simply not, uh, you know, it, it's not acceptable for me that there exists that level of inconsistency where the disability organisations are coming to this committee and saying to me and to my officials that they feel that, this is just not getting the priority I absolutely should. So trying to understand both sides of it. Um, so therefore, uh, you know, the evidence that comes out of this, the consultation responses we get from our improving uh, parking and Scotland consultation uh, will help to inform uh, our next step because I think that is one of the areas where there's a real challenge where a local authority can make the DP stack up financially, but at the same time, we have to ensure that they're not falling behind in enforcement. Um, of, of parking, particularly when it comes to uh, misusing uh, disabled parking bays. So I uh, hope to, 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 to make, that will be some of the uh, work that we take forward. You mentioned the stakeholder group. Mm. Um, are, will the, are there disabled people's organisations represented on that? Mm -hmm. the moment it's a parking manager's uh, stakeholder, so it's taking the local authority parking managers, but I think it would be you know, sensible for us to reflect on those parking managers having a session with disability groups, many of the ones that are represented uh, here and having a particular session with them, uh, whether they should be particular uh, representation on that group is something I'll reflect on with the, the organisation, but I'll come back to perhaps George, who, who's been leading on, on some of this work. Um, yes, member. What um, disabled groups have been part of the um, improving parking in Scotland consultation uh, stakeholder working group. Um, so we have um, liaised with them um, in the development of the consultation document. They also um, we have a, a forum which is called the Roads for All Forum, uh, which discusses a number of. Um, uh, kind of issues around um, our, net our road network in Scotland and, and disability groups are, are featured on that as well. Okay, that's helpful because I think there's a lot of very, very nuanced issues that are often not easily articulated or easily heard in um, uh, public life that came to us when we heard evidence from um, th those groups. 
Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, the, Minister, you've, you've, you've mentioned the, the ability of some local authorities to adopt um, decriminalised park enforcement um, systems and the, perhaps the financial challenges it, it, there. Are, are there any other ways in which the Scottish Government could perhaps assist in um, enabling them to take on enforcement? Just what I've mentioned before, uh, I think we have uh, an obligation now to work with those remaining local authorities. So the 18 employees, three that are going through the process, there may be others that indicate that they might have an interest, but there's clearly some who are probably not going to go down that route because of the cost implication. I think there's then an obligation for us to perhaps work with those local authorities to say, right, how do we get to some sort of hybrid solution here, where either, as I said, you can partner with a neighbouring local authority that might make sense since to, to some local authorities others um, you know it may have to be more of a, of a kind of service level uh, agreement uh, where you know councils can share facilities can share the costs of enforcement um, and there is a similar I think there are similar arrangements in, in, in place in one or two local authorities um, where you know particular local authority is providing the back office support to another authority at a cost so you know that cost is you know, way less than, than than what it would have been to have to set up everything from scratch. So I think that's probably the route that we'd look to go down in the first instance. But as I said previously, we'll also work with COSLA and Scots um, to explore a bit more in detail about you know what are the financial burdens that those local authorities that aren't going down the DP route, what is it that's restricting or, or prohibiting them from doing so? And, and, and we'll work closely with them as part of the uh, parking managers um, stakeholder or uh, group. Thank you, Kareena. Okay, thank you. Uh, Graham Simpson, MSP. Thank you. I just want to um, ask about <coughs> um, private car parks. Um, we've heard there's been a reluctance on private car park operators to make their bays uh, enforceable. Um, do you have any views on that? Um, I obviously noted the evidence from uh, some local authorities and indeed um, some of the groups uh, representing people with a, with a disability. Um, as well, but I also found the evidence that you took from Tesco and NCP very interesting uh, indeed. But I think what came out of that is that you probably had Tesco here who were one of the best in terms of practice, and, 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 and I was very encouraged by what they were saying in terms of the technology that they were going to be bringing in. I think number plate recognition they spoke about, they spoke about even bringing it in in house. They spoke very. I thought they articulated very well uh, the fact that you know uh, they want uh, you know uh, ultimately as many people coming to their supermarket as possible. Therefore, uh, making the experience uh, as good and positive as possible for those with a disability was absolutely in their interest. Um, so it would be wrong to to of course um, tar every business with, with with I'm afraid the because there's a few bad apples that are that are, that, that, that are not enforcing it um, properly so my view is that uh, look where we can um, where we can assist local authorities uh, in their conversations with private businesses or landowners where we can make it less onerous then we should certainly look to do that but where there is good practice going on and I thought Tesco demonstrated in their evidence session here um, that, uh, that, that there was some good practice there that um, you know we should ensure that local authorities just let those businesses get on with it because there's no point in draining local authority resource when it could be used for on-street or indeed other off-street parking that, 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 that is not best practice. So my, my view on this is that um, you know we continue to speak and engage with local authorities but it, I would just caveat all that by saying clearly from the evidence that you took there is some good practice going on. There, there is there is good practice going on, but there are also um, um, car parks where um, people, uh, non-disabled people, are routinely parking in in disabled spaces uh, and get, getting away with it um, because they're not enforceable. So to, should we, uh, and particularly in city centres, when you consider that 42% of disabled people are in employment now, not all of those will drive, of course. But a good, a good, a good number may well do. Um, they need to be able to get to work. Um, we need to have the spaces for them. Very often they'll be using private car parks, so I think it's important that those spaces are available uh, and they're not being used by people who aren't really entitled to use them. So should we be going further, do you think, um, uh, in terms of making those bays enforceable? I think there's a... a a lot of evidence uh, that we have to, to, to sift through. I wouldn't certainly, uh, I think we certainly have to 
uh, explore about how we make enforcement better. Uh, enforcement is different than making bays enforceable, uh, I must say, but we must uh, look at how we make enforcement uh, better. I am not adverse at all uh, at looking at this through the parking manager stakeholders group, but there is also another stakeholder group that we have, which is private parking, looking at specifically the issue of private parking. Um, this is an issue that was raised with me by many MSPs um, uh, across the country. I most recently had a meeting with uh, with uh, Myrtle Fraser, in fact, on this MSP on this uh, very issue, uh, and we are taking forward some of the uh, uh, some of those issues raised uh, in a way that's n you know not requiring necessary legislation at this stage. So a, a single code of practice that is agreed by, for example, the two major um, uh, parking bodies, uh, uh, the BPA and the IPC. Um, also looking at whether or not there is a need for a singles appeals process, for example, or an independent appeals process, etc., uh, etc. Et so there is a power of work that's going on currently. There's a power of work that will take on after the evidence session reports, come, uh, the committee's report comes out and indeed our own consultation is done. So there's clearly an issue from the evidence session that you took of off-street private parking not being enforced to a level that people with disabilities expect it. So therefore, it's incumbent that you know we don't, uh, uh, you know, we do, we we, do, we don't uh, close our minds to any of the options that can improve that situation. So just for clarity, you've got a separate group looking at private parking, and that is that's good. yeah, yes, yeah, so that's been that's been running now for for, for a while that uh, group because there was a number of issues that were raised. From MSPs um, uh, to, 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 to me and uh, even to my predecessor. And uh, there are differences in how the approach to private parking takes place in, in, in England and Wales versus what's up here in Scotland. And um, there's been, you know, there are some current moves. Uh, there may well be moves, I should say, by the UK government to look at private uh, parking. And we've got Queen's Speech coming up today obviously and um, you know that'll be dominated by, by other issues but you know uh, there may well be we're being told or before the election we were certainly told that there may well be moves uh, to, to look at this issue uh, from a legislative point of view now post the elections I, I don't know and we'll wait to see but we'll work very closely with the UK government uh, on that as well as our own private uh, parking uh, stakeholders uh, group that we have uh, the the general feeling was that we we come together on this unified code of practice which includes signage and enforcement and other such things and we give it a trial period of time and if that isn't that kind of uh, that code of practice isn't um uh, you know giving reassurances uh, to people then we certainly should look at uh, other measures um and as i say you know we're even exploring the issues of um independent appeals process uh, uh, within that uh, as well um, just one more question on this one. Yes. Um, uh, the, the, so councils have this ongoing duty to contact um, private uh, car park operators every two years. And the evidence we've heard is that they get very little response and sometimes no response. So should we, do you think we should remove that duty? Section 8 of the, of the bill, I know, took a, uh, got quite an airing at the committee, and again, it would be uh, you know, wrong of us uh, not to, to look at that issue. So we will certainly look at Section 8. We'll look at that specifically uh, through the Parking Managers Working Group that I spoke about. That will be one of the issues that the, that the group will look at and that we'll have consultation with because uh, you know, I recognised what some of the local authorities were saying. There may also be smarter ways or other ways that... Um, Local authorities can uh, contact uh, businesses that are perhaps less financially onerous or burdensome uh, upon them. But we'll listen to local authorities on that. And uh, as I say, I'm not close-minded to exploring whatever suggestions they have. But I know that Section 8 and the revoking of Section 8 got, uh, got quite a lot of airing at this committee. So it's something we're cognizant and aware of. Okay. Okay, thank you. Can I perhaps just explore that just a little bit further, Minister? I mean, I take on board the points made about... Um, the every two years having to to contact uh, you know uh, private operators of, of of car parks but my concern would be that if that obligation is withdrawn even as imperfect as it is and as, as patchy as as implementation of it is that it could send out a message that local authorities 
no longer have to try to have that partnership approach. So that would be a slight nervousness there, I suppose. But I take on board the points that you've made. The, the, the comments in relation to code of practice, I think, are, are well made. But I suppose my constituents in Maidenhill and Springburn, and all our constituents here, uh, would like to see a quality code of practice. But I think they'd be just as interested in the idea of a compliance statement from private car park operators because code of practices sit there to aspire to. What we really need to know is that private car park operators are moving from a code of practice to compliance to that code of practice and that narrative becomes quite important. So I'm wondering if you would that's something you would give consideration to? Yeah, I mean can I say first of all that I share, you know, your concerns that um, if, if section eight was revoked, um, there maybe will be unintended consequences of that. So we share that and that's why uh, again I wouldn't commit to revoking it, but simply having the conversation with local authorities to see how we can make things less onerous and burdensome uh, for them. Uh, in terms of uh, the language, I think your right language is uh, important. So we'll certainly reflect on that. But the message will be very clear to private car parking owners that you know if you don't step up to this, and, and there are challenges, there are issues, and if you don't step up to this, then you know we're, we're not uh, opposed to, to, to bringing and exploring legislation. So you know I think um, that is sort of a message that is uh, got out to private car parking uh, par car park owners. Um, uh, and they understand our seriousness uh, on that. And as I say, the UK government may, may well be legislating on this. I don't know for sure, but certainly there has been some, some talk of that previously, and they may, may, may well be legislating on that. Uh, and where we can dovetail our work with the UK government, uh, particularly on that, then, then, then we will look to do so. That's helpful. Also, Minister, I'm just wondering, in terms of uh, private car park operators, uh, whether or not uh, there has to be a monitoring process if we get to the point of a code of practice and we get potentially to some form of complying statement at a local level rather than a corporate national level, I think would be quite important for, for my constituents. How we, if you like, recognise or reward uh, best practice. So in days going by, we'd be talking about things about quality standard marks or kite marks or or, or what have you. Now, that would be a monitoring process somewhere down the line by some organisation with the local authority or others. But it's not just about you know, a stick to be... A, those who are not providing what they should be doing under equalities legislation, quite frankly, but also about recognising best practice out there. So is the idea of a quality standard mark perhaps uh, recognised by uh, a third sector disability group perhaps could, could help form some of that, the thinking around that to, to recognise best practice out there. But just as important, there has to be some form of light touch monitoring regime across the country, not every car park all the time, but just knowing that occasionally someone can pop in and see, well, actually, are you doing what it says in, the in terms of a code of practice and potentially a complying statement? Yeah, I think the wider point is, is a good one that's made, uh, you know, as well as the disincentive, we should be incentivising those that uh, demonstrate good practice and best practice. So I think the point is one that we'll certainly uh, reflect on and one that mirrors actually uh, my own thinking uh, as well. Um, a couple of things I would add to that uh, when it comes to the private parking standard or code of practice that we're, we're developing with private uh, parking stakeholders monitoring will be absolutely essential and be a part uh, and ha absolutely has to be a part of that there's no point having a, a code of practice and there not be any monitoring and you know we simply don't know if it's working or not working effective or not effective uh, so uh, again once we develop that in a little bit more detail we'll make sure the committee is kept up to date uh, on that in terms of a quality standard mark and parking for those uh, uh, particularly with uh, uh, particularly on, on, on the disability base issue um, it's not something I've had a conversation on uh, with my officials but after this session I'm, I'm more than happy to take away I don't know if my officials particularly have anything to add to that but we'll, we'll have a conversation with them on that it's not something I have uh, at this stage but I think the idea is a, is, is a good one. I mean, if I could just um, come in and add to that, I, th I think that when we look at the code of practice and better regulations um, of private parking operators, um, that includes um, us looking at standard signs um, as well as um, the charges um, to which private parking operators um, are charging individuals. Um, the so it, it is something that we will look at. Um, we do want standard signs. Um, we do want a standardisation across all car parks so that individuals um, are aware of the terms and conditions of the car parks to which they park in and it's easy for them to understand. Thank you. And I'm just 
Going to signpost, got one final question, Minister, about with Jackie Bailey. I'm sure I want to pick through a number of items of evidence that's come up over the course of, of the session. But quite often there there seems to be a lack of clarity over about the the legal position of things imposed by uh, supermarkets and you know private car park operators. And I don't want to sit hairs running because we just want people not to abuse disabled bays and you know hell mends if you do pay your fine as far as I'm concerned. But there has to be certainty in law. In, in, in relation to this, I'm just wondering if certainty in law is something that uh, the minister would be minded to, to look at in relation to it. Yeah. Uh, George reminded me here that, of course, contract law is reserved, and that's why we're working with the UK government uh, on that. But it is an issue. You know, I heard it again in your evidence sessions that um, this concern, I think Elaine Smith maybe raised it, and correct the record office if I'm wrong, but she raised the issue of, uh, you know, people you know if you're not a serial offender if you've offended once and you get a uh, a ticket slapped in your windscreen you just put it in the bin because you know you do google search and you see that uh, you, you decide to wait up versus you know is the supermarket going to take you to the court or not take you to the court and you you, you choose to ignore it uh, and that's where the public awareness campaign perhaps alexander stewart mentioned in the beginning of this uh, evidence session i think could play a part um, certainly, uh, you know, the letting people know and shaming them into the fact that, you know, when you do this, it has a real profound effect potentially uh, on, on a disabled uh, person. But notwithstanding the, that, uh, you know, where we can um, bolster uh, and make more robust the enforcement, then I think, again, it's incumbent on us as a government to look at whether that's in conjunction with the UK government, because, again, contract law, because uh, essentially you enter into a contract when you go to your you know, your, your supermarket or indeed uh, any private car park. Uh, you essentially enter into that contract. So can we have a conversation with the UK government uh, on that? Uh, most certainly, and we continue to do so. And we have a good relationship, I should say, uh, with the UK government on this specific issue. Quite a, an open exchange uh, of views and, and, and information. But I think it's a point well made, and it's not one that's lost on us either, convener. Appreciate that, Minister. And, uh, I'm going to let Miss Bailey in. I know there's a couple of questions we might have to mop up towards the end, but you've been very patient, Miss Bailey, let, let you in at this point. Which is naturally in my nature to be patient, but there you go. Um, I wonder whether I could uh, just set this in a bit of context, because there is the bill, and then there is the context in which the bill sits. So I'm very conscious that what we've been exploring in part is the context rather than the bill itself or the act itself. Um, so would it be fair to say that we, we were... Um, the benefit of hindsight tells us that the bill actually was future-proofed so that whatever the legislative context is, um, whether it's enforcement or traffic regulations or anything like that, that can all change because the bill sits within whatever that legislative framework is. Would you agree with that proposition? Uh, yes, I mean, I think uh, you know, the bill, uh, as you say, uh, to an extent is future-proof, but there's something there that you have a bill and then you have the practical application uh, of that bill and, and what we're seeing here is the practical application the consistency the expectation that people had of that uh, is not practically being realized to an extent that i would want and i suspect members around this table uh, would want so uh, you know the, the, you're right in the sense that come further devolution uh, does, you know, members bill, uh, sorry, uh, bills that come forward from government uh, across this country, whether it's UK government or indeed the Scottish government, the parking landscape and the powers that exist could change. But the aims of the bill uh, to enforce uh, disabled parking bays, to make them enforceable, uh, that uh, should uh, withstand all of those changes that, that take place. If that is the thrust of our question, if I'm getting it. Yeah, and, and it's that I wanted to tease out because you're absolutely right. The bill was about making advisory bays that were on street um, enforceable. It didn't touch on the mechanism of enforcement or cover decriminalised parking, which you know I know that, that you're spending quite a bit of time and, and energy on. And therefore, in, in looking at the bill itself, it only sought to do a very small thing and relied on other things that were the responsibility of the government or local authorities or, or whatever to happen. Um, let, let me focus on off-street parking, because that is where there's been a degree of debate. Um, the Minister will be aware that legislation in respect of private businesses and, and part of that is private parking is reserved, and I would be delighted if we saw measures in, in the Queen's speech. That's why the Bill adopted the approach of using local authorities to encourage because we couldn't legislate directly. Um, other than good practice codes, I'm right in saying I think there is no current legislative remedy for this. 
and therefore I come back to a point the convener made. If you remove section 8 in its entirety, would you put it in its place? Because I think the danger is you send the wrong signal about what intentions are, and I wonder whether I could just pursue this further. Um, it's been suggested to me that whilst local authorities will contact private uh, businesses and, and car parks, um, the private businesses and car parks want to do it themselves rather than relying on the local authority to do it for them. So that contact may have prompted, as the bill did, a flurry of private businesses saying, yes, we'll do this, almost as a competitive thing with other businesses and supermarkets being the case in point. Um, so that's been prompted by the bill and indeed by local authority contact. Has there, any be, has there been any way of measuring that, capturing that? That's a good question. Uh, there's quite, quite a lot in, in, in Miss Bailey's question, so I'll try to pick up, and if I miss anything, of course, just, just come back. Uh, she's absolutely correct, uh, as I've already said, that contract law is, is, is reserved, and when you take your car into a private car park, you're entering into a contract with the uh, owner of that uh, private car park, and therefore what we can do in the Scottish Government is somewhat limited, but I reiterate my point that the conversations with the UK Government on this have been positive, and that's good, and, and, and we should continue that. Um, so notwithstanding... Um, uh, what may or may not be in the Queen's speech or indeed may, may well come forward from the UK government, we would certainly encourage them to to, to work with us um, and, and they have indicated that they would be willing to, to have an exchange of information with us if they choose to move down a legislative path uh, when it comes to, to contract law on this issue of private parking. We would welcome that. So um, we will certainly keep, keep, keep an eye on that. What we can do out with that is she, I think her own words were limited, She's absolutely correct. What we do on that is absolutely limited. Um, but, uh, you know, that's why things like private campaigns, sorry, public campaigns uh, are very, very important, but also codes of practice with some teeth attached to them to the best of our ability uh, are important. That's why taking the BPA and the IPC, the, the, the parking bodies, as you'll know, taking them on the journey with us because they've been part of the collaboration, part of the discussions, taking them with us, is very, very important. In fairness to the BPA and the IPC, they also want to see the misuse stamped out. It gives their car park, their industry, a very bad name, so they want to see it, but they also recognise um, it's not being done. I also share her concerns, as I think I said to the convener as well, that if we revoke Section 8, the signal it could send out uh, is one that, 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 that could be dangerous. So, uh, again, um, not that I think local authorities at all, for, for a second, take this issue lightly, because they, and they do have competing priorities, un undoubtedly, I know that, um, but I do recognise that some do view this contact every two years as being quite financially burdensome and onerous. But I, I also agree with the member. So that's why working with them, with the working park, um, uh, our, our working group on parking with parking managers is, is essential, important. One thing also I would say to, to Miss Bailey, she, she mentioned the good practice being done by some of the larger su supermarket chains, chains. And I think there is an element of competition, you know, better you and better you and so on. And that, that's good and well, and that's to be welcomed. I, I think where some of the difficulty may be is with slightly smaller businesses. You know, larger businesses have the resource um, uh, to, to, to do some of this, particularly when techno technology is involved. Number plate recognition cameras are not cheap. Whereas smaller businesses may well not put the priority on this that we would like to see. And what we do in that regard um, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is where we should focus some attention. In terms of a question about whether we monitor what business does, to my uh, knowledge, uh, you know, uh, other than the reports we get from local authorities, um, there's there's not enough you know information there about what private business is doing. So I think again that's something that we should reflect on uh, on the back of the evidence sessions uh, that uh, have taken place. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful because the measure of success, if you listen to local authorities, is, well, they've written out and nobody's responded to them. You don't actually measure whether that's had an impact on the business doing it themselves or making any changes, as the supermarkets, as one example, clearly did um, during the passage of, of the bill. Um, my recollection of Section 8 is that we don't prescribe how the contact should be made, simply the frequency. And I would invite the minister, as he suggested he will do, to look at other examples. Fife gave evidence to us about, you know, an approach that didn't wait every two years, but they simply put it up on the, the council's website and used planning as a mechanism um, to do that. Can, can I move on to the new powers you have? Because this is something I think 
would improve the impact of, of the Act, because you've got new powers over traffic regulations, as I understand them, that, that may or may not remove the need for TROs, certainly removes the need for signs and street furniture, should you choose to do that, and potentially is, makes life easier for local authorities and enables bays to be designated much quicker. Because um, I think the problem arose because TROs are such a complicated process that local authorities, instead of going through that, just simply designated it as an advisory bay, which is how the problem came about. So I would be keen to explore with the minister if, if he is minded to use the new powers that, that he now has to actually simplify the process and remove that particular burden from local authorities. I'm always happy to look at how we simplify the process. I wouldn't commit to removing the need for a TRO because, again, I would like to explore what may be the unintended consequences. Now, I'm dealing with a TRO in my, my own constituency and uh, I won't say too, too much on it, but uh, I know that it does have some complexities uh, uh, attached to it. Um, but the positive, of course, of a TRO is it does allow for consultation. It allows public to, cons uh, to be consulted in a TRO to give their expressions or objections uh, either way, either in support or, of course, uh, against uh, the TRO. So that element of consultation, I think, is quite important. And the TRO, TRO helps to facilitate that. Now, could we have a consultation process minus the TRO? Of course, we absolutely could. So uh, can I look into that and give a commitment? to explore it, but not give you a commitment of whether I would revoke or remove that uh, particular uh, criteria. Uh, in terms of uh, wider powers uh, that we may uh, well have, um, she probably knows that uh, you know we, we have, as the Scotland Act has, has come in, uh, more powers over signage, for example. And um, again, that's something that I'm keen to explore. But equally, I go back to the point I've just made that we've got to be cognizant and aware of unintended consequences. So if we simplify the signage process so it's less financially onerous uh, on local authorities, what we don't want to do is make disabled parking bays less visible. That would be the wrong thing to do. So it's just finding that balance, I think, for us is important. But generally, the commitment to look at um, both, both um, the, the TRO process and also signage um, certainly are uh, things that we're exploring with the, uh, the, the working group and indeed having internal discussions in government about uh, as we speak. OK. Um, can I turn to enforcement convener? Um, Sorry. If you'll indulge me slightly, just on TROs, there's a, I'll, I'll let you back in immediately after this, okay. but it's just a, a final wee thing on TROs, because that was the little thing we had left to mop up um, a, a, as a committee. Um, I think uh, Ms Bailey makes a really good point in relation to TROs. I deal with them in my constituency as, as well, Minister. Invariably, the local authority, each time I request something to happen in terms of parking restrictions, it doesn't have to be an enforceable parking bay. It can be single, double yellow lines or whatever restrictions that needs a designation order uh, enforced. The local authority tends to say these these are expensive to do, they take a long time, we'll wait till we've got a cluster of potential uh, work in an individual area and then we'll wrap it all together, we'll cluster it together and we'll consult and that is the one TRO. And that can lead to lengthy delays and complete uncertainty to when relevant restrictions or alterations and restrictions come into place in my constituency. So I'm just wondering, when you do look at um, new powers that the government has in relation to these designation orders, whether you look wider than just a uh, disabled parking base, because I think there's a wider issue, and that's certainly a constituency interest of mine and other members may have had similar experiences. It sounds, ministers, if perhaps you've got a similar experience in, in your constituency. And it's something that's, that has come up. Um, I wouldn't say it fills up my post bag uh, by any stretch of imagination, but it has been raised on, on, on a number of occasions with me that uh, TRO process uh, perhaps uh, could be simplified, um, could be more transparent, um, is not understood well uh, by the public because it's not um, articulated well, I think. So, you know, in terms of the, the convener, your, your wider point that this is not just necessarily about disabled parking bays, although that's a very important part, and obviously the reason why we're, we're, we're here having this evidence session, but there's much wider issues around TRO. Uh, certainly, I'm happy to have conversations um, with officials to um, have a conversation with COSLA local authorities about um, how they feel the TRO process works, whether they're comfortable with it, but also actually with maybe we can we can have a wider look at um, whether or not uh, you know uh, 
th th there's more that we can do on that. So uh, certainly looking at TRO as well as looking at uh, TSR, uh, GD as well, um, as I say now that we have devolved responsibility for the signage um, as well. You've lost me your acronyms there, Minister, but I'll gloss over that and I'll pass back to Miss Bailey. <laughs> Um, can I turn to enforcement? And, and I heard a lot of what you said and was encouraged by um, the, the advance of decriminalised parking. Certainly in my local area, or at least one of them, the local authority is very efficient at issuing fixed penalty notices. Um, and I suspect a lot of them um, do generate some income from it. Um, but, but leaving that to one side, um, I had, at the start of the bill process, anticipated um, a reactive enforcement um, regime, if you like, recognising that city centres would, would invariably demand more activity than, say, a residential area. Um, but I wonder whether coupling this with public awareness is something that the Minister would also consider with his officials, because enforcement and public awareness absolutely go together. And I'm very conscious that the police will run, you know, occasional campaigns on whether it's seatbelt compliance or mobile phone usage or whatever. Um, so to do it that way would be quite proactive and I think would be, would be welcomed. Um, but to do it alongside public awareness, I think, is key. Now, eight years ago, I asked the then minister, Stuart Stevenson, to run a public awareness campaign. He said he would go away and, and take a look at it. Um, unfortunately, nothing happened. I do think it needs to be a nationally-led campaign, and by all means, local authorities and police and others um, should be in support of that. Um, so I wonder whether the minister would, would consider it being a national campaign, because it is about changing attitudes, and you do that across Scotland, not just at an individual local authority level. Yeah, um, uh, I should say that uh, for the convener's sake and, and others, um, sorry, they do often get lost in acronyms, uh, TSRGD, Traffic Signs Regulations and General Directions, uh, which is the manual that covers signage. And um, uh, as it's uh, just covering for my colleagues. Since, the, sure. <laughs> since the definition of <laughs> you're uh, you are kind as you are generous, um, convener, in that respect. Uh, in terms of uh, Jackie Bailey's point um, I think it's one that's well made I just took part in a, a photo call for a, a mobile phone awareness campaign that we're doing uh, you know whether it's on hands free or, or otherwise um, people taking a look at the mobile phones actually can cause well have fatal consequences in some regards and the importance of awareness campaigns on a national level is something that we're certainly signed up to uh, you know I don't want to give her uh, an answer that simply says look I'll go away and look at it and you know, we'll explore it, and she understands that there's competing priorities for national campaigns. All have merit. Uh, what I will do is come back to the member, perhaps after the recess, on this, um, having reflected. And either way, if I come back and say, look, I'm afraid, and you know, other priorities have taken over, or indeed, um, uh, I say yes, this is something we'll definitely do. Then I'll come back to the member either way. Um, uh, again, I, I won't give a commitment uh, either way here, but I will certainly look at it because I think there's merit uh, in this issue. But again, I do have to weigh up with other priorities, you know, uh, literally uh, uh, behaviours that uh, are killing people uh, on our roads. And, and, and that is where our focus is uh, on the safety message. But that is not to say that uh, a, a, a national campaign on this particular issue uh, does not have merit, because uh, I absolutely see that it does have merit. It is just about weighing it up uh, with the other campaigns that, uh, of course, all all, all uh, uh, come attached with uh, resource and, and financial implications. But uh, certainly, I'll come back to her at some point uh, after the recess, because I want the I want the consultation to to be complete, which is for local authorities. We extended it to thirty first of August. Um, and, and obviously I'm looking forward to the report from this committee and then perhaps on reflection of that uh, we'll certainly give a, uh, our th my thoughts on, on, on a awareness campaign to Miss Bailey and obviously to the wider committee as well. And I have one final question, convener, and that's on the stakeholder group. I noticed the minister's reluctance to have me along, um, but, but could I maybe just offer him the slogan, nothing about us without us, which is used widely in the disability movement. Um, Having taken the bill through, I am reminded of the particular views of parking managers, um, and they have their perspective on the issue. I think you'll find that a disabled person's perspective might be quite different. Um, and, you know, hence, I would encourage him, if not me, certainly to invite somebody from, you know, a disability group directly onto the parking group, not another group, but directly on the one that's going to make decisions about this. 
Yeah. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, Miss Bailey uh, should not uh, take anything I said personally uh, in the slightest. She knows that uh, no, she knows that I only have the highest regard uh, for her, and she can put that in an election leaflet in the future uh, if she wishes. Um, that the... might not help. Me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a point well made. Uh, what I would do is go back to what George said uh, that um, disabled groups, disability groups, and organisations uh, are on a number of our stakeholder uh, groups. This working. So this um, parking managers working group is specifically looking at the local authority barriers or restrictions as they perceive it in terms of this legislation. But notwithstanding that, uh, her point about how we engage, engage uh, dis disability groups is, is an important one. And that slogan, nothing about us without us is for us. Uh, you know, an anti-apartheid slogan, of course, now adopted by many organisations, but one that uh, rings true for, for disability organisations and groups uh, is certainly one uh, that uh, I think we should be cognisant of and, and, and aware of. So um, disability groups, as I say, and as, as, as um, George has been saying, are part of a number of working groups, uh, and particularly on improving parking. Uh, stakeholder, uh, uh, stakeholder engagement uh, as well. But where we can reflect on including them in, in wider conversations, certainly. But the working, the parking managers working group, I'm getting myself lost here, uh, and, and in some of the uh, the wording of these uh, working groups, that uh, that is specifically looking at local authority issues around the application of this legislation. Thank you very much, convener. Okay, Miss Bailey. Uh, would any other members wish a question before we wrap things up? Agenda item one. Uh, Minister, just before we close this, this, this agenda item, we, we're of course very keen as a committee for you to revert to Ms Bailey with additional information, but would also point out that it's actually this committee that's doing the post-legislative scrutiny. So if you could make sure you, you, you direct your correspondence in relation to this in the first instance to this committee, and of course to Ms Bailey and other members of the parliament, but we're doing a body of work and it's only important and right that, that we get that information. Uh, I think it's been a, members will agree, it's been a really informative evidence session. Government would appear to be in, in, in listening mode and we, we thank you very much for your, your your thoughtful answers here this morning yourself and your officials. So so thank you very much. That, that concludes agenda item one. Uh, given that agenda item two is already disposed of, we'll now move to agenda item three on our work programme and as previously agreed we will now move into private session. Can we suspend please? <laughs>